Hey, everybody out there, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. You're in my corner, and I have a very special guest who has joined me in the corner today. Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Yes, my name is J.D. Cullum. Hi. And how is the weather out where you're where you're at? Probably a lot better than it is here. <laughs> oh, my gosh, the weather's quite nice. Uh, we've had a patch of rain and yuckiness, but now it's getting back to uh, the reason why I moved out here, which was, you know, sunny California. So this is the way, this is the weather I wanted. I don't know what happened the last few weeks, but this is this is what I ordered. I was in San Francisco last weekend. It was very nice out there. I, I hadn't been near the ocean in a really long time, so seeing that much water amazed me. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, it's so funny because I'm here in uh, the San Fernando Valley, and I, I've been in LA almost 20 years, and I hardly ever get down to the ocean. It's it's just one of those things. When you live here, you kind of take it for granted. Definitely, I can understand that. Well, good to know that uh, we have clear skies over there. Thank you for the weather report. <laughs> and now, before I get to, too off track, because I've had a lot of people curious, um, I did a little bit of research, and really I couldn't find much on why you wanted to become an actor or your origins. All I could find is that you wanted to fo uh, follow in your father's footsteps. So could you give us a little bit more of a detailed uh, explanation? Sure. Well, I mean, that, that's pretty much it. You know, I, I knew nothing else when I was a kid. My dad, uh, whose name is John Cullum, um, when I was growing up, he was a particularly well-known Broadway actor. Uh, actually, he still is. He recently celebrated his 50th anniversary on Broadway. But when uh, I was growing up, he was doing a lot of um, musicals. And um, really having nothing else to do, because I was an only child and kind of bored, I uh, went to the show with him on weekends during matinees and stuff and hung around the theater and, of course, got to know everyone and learn the lyrics back and forth and generally make trouble in the theater. And, you know, something about that experience sort of got into my blood, and so I, I respond to theater very much and I respond to acting. Um, it feels like home to me. And, uh, and then, you know, at home I would mess around with a tape recorder and record funny voices and you know, like little skits and stuff, as, as a lot of people do who uh, eventually become actors. And then um, in high school, uh, I did a production of Romeo and Juliet, and the girl who was playing Juliet had a talent agent. She was a lovely um, actress. Her name actually is uh, Mia Stara, who you may remember from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And, in fact, she was my first girlfriend, which was, which was very exciting. Oh, cute. <laughs> yeah, and so she came to she, – her agents came to see this production in high school – and they said, well, this kid's good, too. Do you, want to, do you want to sign, you know, do you want to sign up? So then I started going on auditions. And uh, eventually I got into um, off-Broadway theater. And I really had no training. I really still have no training. Uh, basically, I learned how to audition. And then once I got the job, I, I relied on my father to kind of help me through the basics. And then I just kind of figured it out by um, imitating, you know, other actors and trying to see what they were doing. I think that's, you know, that's one way to learn it. Then I came out here when I was about uh, 23 and, uh, you know, had been uh, making my living here. And I always hear that uh, Los Angeles is sort of the, the place you need to be if you really want to be in, you know, all the TV stuff. And uh, voiceover is definitely growing in, in that area as well, I've, I've heard. Uh, yeah, you know... Um, of course, Hollywood is the film and television capital, and uh, there's there's also a lot of voiceover activity in in New York as well. But um, but I've I've found a good place in voiceover here, and uh, got set up with a really good agent who uh, I've been with for a number of years, and uh, you know I've I've gotten some good lucky breaks with that. Um, if you listen to uh, if you listen to Saturday morning uh, television, uh, you might hear my name on uh, some commercials. I mean, hear my voice. <laughs> so, well, commercials is always one way to do it, and I think that's uh, usually a, a, lo a way that a lot of people get into voiceover. But how did you discover that? Well, it was, you know, again, I have to credit my father. Um, he was with this uh, very, very reputable agency, um, which is ICM, which is one of the big ones. And he would go in to um, read material. Um, that, that's the way it works, by the way. If anyone wants to know, uh, what happens is your agent uh, contacts you, usually emails you, and says, can you come in tomorrow morning and read some copy? And you come in, and there's about, you know, 20 actors there. People have been called in. And the agent hands out the material and kind of pairs up people if it's what's called a group read, meaning a, a commercial with, you know, multiple people in it. Or if it's what's called a single, then that means it's just, you know, 
lines. It's just solo. And they have four booths operating at my agency. And you go in and, and literally, you know, you just do your audition there. But anyway, my father got called in many years ago for one of these calls, and so I accompanied him, and he introduced me to uh, Jeff Danis, who was the head of the voiceover department at ICM. And uh, Jeff, who's very open-minded, said, oh, well, come on in the booth, you know, give it a shot. And, um, you know, with all my experience from doing theater, um, and I'm pretty quick on my feet in terms of reading, you, you do have to be a very strong, um, cold reader. Um, uh, he, he said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get you in the loop. You know, you have a, a nice voice, you sound young, and uh, you're facile. So it just started that way. I kind of lucked into it, I guess. Well, that's a good thing, though, and I think that, you know, voiceover for a lot of people is so much fun because you can essentially be anything, technically. You're not really restricted by costumes or makeup or anything like that. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you wouldn't believe, you know, some of these, like there's an actor you're, you're fans might probably know of uh, Billy West, um, you know, who's, I'd say about five foot three, five foot four, but he can do the voice like this. I mean, he can do anything. <laughs> he, he can sound like anything. It's extraordinary. You close your eyes and you, you would think he could, he could just be any character. I mean, some of these voice people are just extraordinary. And plus, you don't have to dress up for the auditions. You can come in looking like a slob, you know? It's really great. And then a lot of people work out of their house. I don't have a booth here at my house, but there's a, a lot of um, actors who just literally get out of bed and step into their booth and make some money. Our closet, our uh, into yeah. their egg carton room <laughs> or whatever. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I just love the fact that, you know, you can kind of be whatever you want to be. I kind of brag to people, too, even though I'm not necessarily in voice or anything, because, like, I'm still in a big T-shirt and, and shorts. I'm not really, you know, dressed for the occasion. And I, I think that must be such a relief, especially because you have so much traffic in L.A. and, and you have to, everybody's in such a hurry and all that stuff. Yeah, it's true. I mean, there's just there's just very little limitation, you know. It's just whatever you can do with your voice. And um, it really does require acting skill, um, you know, and it can be it can be somewhat of a pressure situation. I mean, uh, you know, for a radio commercial or a TV commercial, they may say, can you say this sentence like this? Can you do this word like this? Can you make it sound like you're more excited? Can you make it sound like this or that? And you literally just have to be able to do this on the spot and, um, and generate different reads. And, uh, you know, you have to rely on your acting talents um, in, order, in order to do this stuff. And I, I didn't think it was... Uh, before I did it, I didn't think it would be that hard, but now I've realized, you know, there's really a, a craft to it. And is there anything that you can think of that you would have liked to learn or liked to know of the first time you were able to voice act that you know now? Um, I think, you know, I wish I just had a little bit more exposure to the animation world. The animation world is kind of the, the holy grail of uh, voiceover. And... Um, it's, it's quite hard to break into that world, and uh, the, only the sort of the most elite, elite, talented people um, get in there, and also the ones who are the, the most well-connected. So I think um, it would have been prudent if I'd been able to uh, get a little better connected with voiceover people, and uh, that might have helped me get more into the animation loop. You know, I'm still knocking on the door, and actually I feel like... Uh, you know, the, the voice acting I'm doing in these games, is, you know, may, may help in that area. Um, but uh, the, the animation is, is really a really tough uh, circle to get into. I can understand that with animation. I know with video games specifically, video games are becoming this medium that's, you know, gaining so much money. There's so much money in video games now, it's practically insane. And, you know, everyone from your grandma to, you know, your little niece is, is playing those type of things. And it's interesting to see how they're becoming more and more of an art form and they're sort of perfecting getting, you know, actors in there and, and taking more care that there's more of a performance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that that enhances, you know, the quality of the game. And that's why, you know, they really want to go for, like, strong union actors who have strong um, backgrounds, often theater actors, because the, um, there's a lot of what they call stressful vocal work which requires, you know, a great deal of projection and yelling, you know, especially if it's, you know, there's a military setting or something like that in the game, explosions going on, you know, and you, you have to be prepared to shout, you know, for four hours. And, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of technique you need to have to do that. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, 
it's great, you know, and the directors are getting better, you know, they, they um, and the writing is good, so it, it really is um, a fully, uh, you know, a full acting experience to do these. And I always hear that reaction sounds, you know, the screaming and the ah and all that stuff is a very uh, difficult to do just in general. But I hear a lot of people think it's the funnest thing of the session. What are your opinions on it? Well, I mean, it's so bizarre. They'll say like, OK, you know, I, I want you to sound like, you know, you've been set on fire um, <laughs> or you've been you're being eaten by an alien. Like, how how does that sound? Like, there's no template for being eaten by an alien. So you just, like, have to make up sounds, you know, and y you just improvise. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of improv in, uh, in voiceovers. Um, there's, a, you know, there, um, there's a lot of flexibility. They, can, they let you try different things. They let you try different effects and sounds, and it can be a very collaborative experience. So, yeah, all, that, all those sound effects and grunts, you know, you just got to, like, create as many as you can. You, you, you know, it's, it's fun. And I believe that the listeners would probably shoot me if I didn't ask, but I'm sort of curious uh, about your role as Kuja and Dissidia. How would you come across that one? You know, it was just the usual. Um, in fact, I think it was what's called uh, an e-audition or, or an MP3 audition, which means that I didn't even have to go into the office. I, um, they just uh, emailed me the sides, which are the, uh, the audition material, and I went up into my closet with my little, uh, what is it I have, like an M-Track, like a little handheld field recorder, and recorded that audition and emailed it off to them, and, you know, you get the job. Sometimes you don't hear for weeks, and then they call you and they say, oh, they want you for this, and you go, what? What was that? When? When did I do what? And so it's just, it's just the usual process. You know, you just, keep, you just keep casting your line out there, and then once in a while, you catch a fish. Was there anything specific they asked uh, for that character? Because he had previously never been voiced before, from what I understand. And in his original game, he, they didn't have voices yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what they might have told you in terms of uh, character-wise. Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question, because I really um, am not an expert or familiar with the whole landscape of video games. You know, I'm just, I'm just an actor doing my thing. So I needed some direction, and... and um, they explained to me that, you know, they wanted kind of a, a sort of feminine quality, um, you know, a higher voice kind of ethereal quality. So we, uh, we worked on that for a while, and, you know, we, we had to do a bit of adjusting and, and trying different things before we kind of found the sweet spot for that character. Because he's got, you know, he's got a high voice, and I have a naturally high voice, and they did not want me to emphasize, you know, the, the lower range of my voice. They wanted me to keep it, keep it higher. Definitely, and I, I would think that would be hard, but hearing your natural speaking voice, I can see how that would be a little bit easier for someone like you instead of someone who's doing the, the gurgly war voices all, you know, all week. Yeah, I'm, I'm naturally a tenor, and so, I mean, sometimes, you know, people on the other end of the phone will go, yes, ma'am, and I'm like, I'm not a woman, okay? <laughs> you know, but <laughs> got a high voice, what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> Now, were you a little bit surprised uh, with fan reactions? Have you seen any fan reactions for that game at all? Um, yeah, you know, I've 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 uh, I've been out sort of in the in in the on the web and looked at you know people's responses and you know some people are positive and some people are very critical and I just go hey wow you know it's great to just be out there and I mean I even appreciate you know the more critical comments because I I feel like I. Um, I don't know enough about this. I mean, you know, as a theater actor, I know a great deal about theater, and, and I pride myself on, on understanding the plays um, that, I'm, that I'm involved in. But in this area, I, I really don't know these games well enough, and I, I should, uh, you know, try to learn a little bit. So when I go out and look around on the web, it helps me learn. Well, maybe one day you can get a gaming system and try for yourself. <laughs> Right on. I think I, you know what? I think I would never like leave my desk after that. That's the only problem. <laughs> I have a really hard time with handheld games. I feel like the only time I can play them is when I'm traveling, like in an, an on an airplane or something along those lines. Really? Yeah, I have kind of an addictive personality, so I have to be careful what I get involved with, or else it'll just like, you know, swamp my whole life. Too much solitaire. It's bad for you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But I think with that, we're going to take a very short break, but don't go anywhere, fanatics. We'll be right back with our special guest here on 91.8 The Fan. So don't go anywhere and keep it tuned to your favorite station, where we play everything you want and nothing you don't. 
This is a public service announcement. It has recently come to our attention that not wearing shirts causes Sasnat cancer, double herpes, and super diabetes. To prevent these made-up illnesses, 918 The Fan is distributing protective clothing specifically designed to protect you from hazardous materials through a patented process that we won't explain because you'll probably just be too stupid to understand this totally not fake or made-up science. To get your protective garment, simply head over to 918thefan.com and click on the apparel button under store. Remember, only 918 The Fan's protective shirts are 100% effective in protecting you from the radiation given off by death crystals and dysentery lasers. Don't settle for cheap imitations. It could cost you your life. Welcome back to 91.8 The Fan. You're still sitting in my glorious corner, and I still have my guest here. Would you like to show a sign of life? Hello, I'm still here, J.D. Cullum. Always good to know that you're still still alive. That's, that's always a good thing. <laughs> we were sort of talking behind the scenes during the part that you guys don't get to listen to, <laughs> uh, about uh, some projects you were working on that have recently come out or that are going to come out soon. Would you like to update us on that? Yeah, well, I thought I was talking about a project that might be of interest to your to your listeners, um, which is a game called um, L.A. Noir, and I worked um, as a motion capture actor, or you know, as we call it, mocap actor, and that was uh, my first experience with that, and it was really fascinating and challenging, and ultimately a very gratifying experience. Um, and the the cast of actors, I mean, gosh, there must have been like a hundred actors involved in this thing. The lead actor was a fellow named Aaron Staten, who is uh, one of the actors from Mad Men, one of the, the ad guys. Um, you'll, you'd recognize him if you, if you uh, IMDB him. And then uh, one of the other guys was uh, plays the psychiatrist on Mad Men. But anyway, um, I don't know how much people know about this, but, I mean, basically you have to put on this, like, blue leotard. Um, <laughs> and then they stick all of these reflective balls all over your body, like 50 or 60 of these, uh, of these reflective balls, and then they put you in a room where you're surrounded by 50 um, cameras, and then when they roll the cameras, the image that appears is only the motion of these balls. Um, so that is how they, uh, you know, create the physical life of these characters, is, is you know, they, they track these movements. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, they add all the animation later. And, and also, once you're finished with the physical, you know, your body work, then you go in and do all of just your, just your face. So they put all these things on your face and have you do all the lines that way. So then they put the face and the body together and they, you know, then they clothe you and dress you and they put you in the setting. And it's just, it's just amazing. It's freaky to see yourself like that. And it's funny because I've heard that as motion capture gets more and more intense, you know, there you'll be filming for anywhere from actually like 160 days, like something ridiculous, like a movie set. So I think that's that's sort of an interesting experience you got to have. Yeah, I mean, Aaron, you know, the lead was like he was there just every day. I think it was last summer we made it. And he was just there every day. And like, what a trooper. He just kept going. But the, one of the cool things about it is. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of cool things about it, but I mean, like the set, like, for instance, if you have a car, if you're supposed to be in a car, they'll just, like, make it out of Apple boxes, you know, <laughs> and, like, put a fake steering wheel there, and, you know, suddenly you're in a car, um, or, and, and, and another great part of it is you don't, it, it's very helpful to learn your lines, and I, I shouldn't tell tales out of school, but if you don't know your lines, for instance, if you're supposed to be standing around a table or a desk, you can literally put your lines right in front of you on the desk and a, and a can of Diet Coke, and it will not show up on camera. Nothing will show up on camera except those balls. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool. And then they encourage you. This medium is, is um, ideal for stage actors because you need to really be physical with your movements. You can't just be static. You know, they don't want you just to stand around delivering your lines. They want a lot of movement. So that's very um, fun for, you know, the theater actors who, who are very strong in that area. It's funny because when you, when you were talking about the car, it kind of sounded like when, you, when you're a little kid and you sit in the box and you pretend that it's a race car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Have you gotten to see any of uh, the, the final product at all, any of the, the graphics or anything like that? No, the, you know, they did give me the privilege of, like, seeing my face, like, the, after they animated my face. And, um, 
um, and then they showed me the settings. It, it's really cool. I mean, they they basically like mapped out um, Los Angeles in the 50s, a very very extensive um, map. Uh, so, like for instance, if you turn down, you know, any random street, it will it will be that street from the 50s. Like you can walk into a building, or you know, check into a look in a doorway or something, and it will be that actual place. So they've like created this whole virtual city um, that you can wander around in. And uh, I mean, I was just blown away by how extensive this game was. That sounds really neat. I've seen little tidbits here and there, and I wasn't sure if it was just going to be, you know, a, a shooter or what it was going to be. So it's kind of neat to hear that it's as expansive as it is. Oh, my God. And then the scripts. I mean, it's all like these huge, you know, these the scripts, each one are like these, you solve these cases. What did I play? I played like, you know, one of those like forensic fingerprint type guys. And um, the scripts are like 600 pages long. Because um, depending on what the uh, the player wants to do, you know, they're all different options. So you have to record, like, so many different options, um, so many different directions to allow for, like, the full freedom of the experience. So these scripts are just enormous. Now, does that ever get confusing when it's like you were just sort of being maybe nice to the player and now you have to be mean to the player due to what the player cho- chose? Or is that just a, a lot easier for you to do? Um it is kind of bizarre, and it's usually not, you know, necessarily with the player, but it'd be like you'll be having a scene with a guy and, you know, talking about something, and you seem to be getting along with him, and then they'll do it again, and you're like, okay, now you hit him. Like, wait a minute, I don't understand. <laughs> now you're fighting. Okay, now you're friends. Like, so these are all different ways to go, and it's really hard to, like, puzzle it all out. You, you just, like, you just do what you, they tell you. You're like, okay, whatever, I guess, I guess I'm supposed to hit him now. Well, besides the hitting part, you actually sounded like a good guy, being a, a forensic guy. Would would you describe your character as being m- more on the side of the law? <laughs> yes, yes, he actually is on the side of the law, works in the police station. But what I like about him is, like, he's kind of crusty and irritable. And, you know, he's, he's um, you know, these are very gritty characters from the 50s. You know, it's that kind of, it is really that noir feeling. It's it's everyone kind of talks very direct, and they're tough, and they're all hard-boiled cops, you know. And you can really kind of, uh, you know, do a lot of acting. They're very strong characters. And, and you have a theater director there, you know, um, staging the scenes, and it's almost like you're putting on a play, except you're all wearing these blue leotards. And I do have to say, it does get a little tedious, like, looking at men in blue leotards all day. <laughs> and, like, when a female shows up, you're, like, really glad she's there. You're like, wow, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I, I can understand that. I've also heard that there's a, a ton of um, quote-unquote ball jokes that you can make. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just so easy to, to make those jokes. I, I mean, it, I, I will say it's it's a little uncomfortable to have 50, 50 balls stuck to your body because it's, like, really hard to even sit down. You can't really cross your legs. They're on your hands and stuff. But then you, like, learn ways of, like, taking off your glove with your mouth, you know, and then, like, there's Velcro everywhere. So you can, like, stick things to yourself. and It's just bizarre. You, but you <laughs> learn about it. By the end of, like, a couple of days, you're like, okay, I get it. I get how it works. Well, hopefully you didn't have too many takes where the balls fell off and you had to redo the take. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Is there anything else that you have up and coming that you'd like to tell the listeners about? You know, there's not a lot um, on a larger scale that's going on. You know, I, I do a lot of theater locally in Los Angeles, so I'm currently in rehearsal for a play right now at my theater company in North Hollywood, California. Um, and really, that's how I kind of sustain myself as an artist. Uh, I, I recently did do an episode of Mad Men, which was kind of fun, um, which is really an extraordinary show to work with because, uh, you know, the historical accuracy... I mean, is is frightening. I, I uh, I'm from New York City, as I said, and there was a phone book from 1963, and I went in there and I looked up and I saw my mom in the phone book from 1963. Oh like, wow! Yeah, it was really freaky. And actually, I also saw the hardware store that I used to go to when I was a kid. I was like, there's Harris Hardware. I mean, everything, you know. And then, I guess like the cigarettes that they use because you can't actually use um, tobacco in the workplace 
so you cannot smoke real tobacco on the set. So they have to, like, make these packages of Lucky Strikes kind of from the ground up. So, so they make these the, the decals and everything and then create the package and then have to make the cigarettes out of herbal cigarettes and then stuff them into the, to ba- you know, into the, the package. It's just really complicated. So... That's prop making to the extreme. <laughs> yeah, they're very, very meticulous about it. Uh, and then I also just worked on a show called The Event, which was, uh, which was kind of fun. It was a sort of a smaller part, but, uh, but still, you know, these days, I mean, you, you take whatever you can get. You know, you're really lucky if you're able to get some work. I also worked on um, The Closer a little while ago, which was, which was nice as well. And now I'm kind of curious for all the fans out there, is there any place on the Internet where you keep people up to date on what you're doing? Do you do the social network thing or anything like that? You know, I'm so terrible at all this stuff, and I really need to, I really need to get with it. Because um, I don't have, even have a website. I do have a Facebook page, you know, J.D. Cullum. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got my friends there. But I tend to not promote myself very much, I guess because I'm um, maybe too modest or something. Um, and that sort of was how I was raised, because my, my father as an actor really never promoted himself very much. So, you know, I'm out there and I can be found. I also have a YouTube a page that has my uh, my actor's reel on it. You can see me there. So I'm out there, but not out there as much as I'd like to be, darn it. Well, if you have anything upcoming that you want us to promote, we'll make sure to tell the listeners out there, just uh, in case you, you haven't got your own outlet together at that point. <laughs> Cool. Well, there is another video game that's coming out. I just did some work on it last week, of course, because of my con- confidentiality agreement. I can't really talk about it, but it will be out there, and I can tell you it's it's really cool. And I, I this this is another character that's very fun to play, and not just screaming and yelling, but like a real character. I mean, it was just a, a blast to work on. Oh, we love those precious NDAs. Yep, uh. yep. <laughs> I know. I know you got to be careful. Hey, <laughs> understandable. We don't want to. We don't want to pressure you at all. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious. Have you ever thought about doing the the convention thing at all? Because uh, Geekdom certainly has a a big convention uh, circuit all across the U S. Sure. You know, I would be open to it. I I would. I had no idea that there would be you know uh, even a place for me. Many years ago, I worked on Star Trek: The Next Generation, and I was a Klingon, and. I had no idea, you know, what I was getting into, and I did a few episodes as this Klingon boy, and then suddenly the response and, you know, people just wanted to know so much, and I actually did a convention in Canada. What a crazy experience, and I still get fan mail where they want me to, like, because I have a little playing card, so they, you know, I have to sign these cards and send them off to people. So sure, you know, I, I would love to, I would love to learn more about this world. You know, I feel like it's my obligation as an actor to, to, you know, do a little more research and to meet some people, you know, and to, to try to be supportive of the fans. Well, I know definitely in Los Angeles there are some big anime conventions and a, a few a few video game com- uh, conventions that are, are mostly for press. We don't know how much they, they do guest-wise, but hopefully we'll see you at one in the future. <laughs> yeah, just uh, send me an email and I'll show up. <laughs> now, as we're getting closer to the end of our, our time together, I'm sort of curious if you'd be willing to participate in a 91.8 The Fan tradition. Well, gosh, uh, you got my heart beating a little bit. What do I have to do? <laughs> <laughs> we do it live on air, uh, if you accept, and we were wondering if you'd be willing to do a radio bump for us. Well, sure, it'd be my pleasure. Awesome. We basically just asked if you would be willing to say, my name is, you say your name, I do this, you can say certain roles you've done, or just you're an actor, whatever you want to fit there, and you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. Okay, let me see here. So, um, wait, hold on. My little... The search for paper. <laughs> I know, exactly, the search for paper, you got it. Because um, I think I'll probably say, like, this is J.D. Cullen, and I'm the voice of Kuja for Dissidia. Does that sound good to you? Can yeah, you it sounds that? perfect. <laughs> and and then, hold on. And then you want me to say what? 98. 91. And you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. 91.8 The Fan. Cool. All right. So whenever you're ready, take one. Okay. Hey, this is J.D. Cullum. I'm the voice of Kuja for Dissidia, and you're tuned to 90. <laughs> <laughs> What was it again? 
91.8 The Fan. 91.8 The Fan. Okay. The numbers every, always get everybody, so don't worry. I know, right? I, I came crashing into that. <laughs> okay, we're still rolling? Yes, we're still rolling. Take two. Hey, this is J.D. Cullum, and I'm the voice of Kuja for Dissidia, and you're tuned to 91.8 The Fan. Woo, that was perfect. You survived. <laughs> yeah, I made it. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners out there? Um, just, you know, I'm grateful for the work and, you know, thank you for, you know, asking me questions and letting me talk about that, about myself. Actors love to talk about themselves. <laughs> well, we love to hear from it. And thank you so much for joining us. This was a great experience. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And for anybody out there that missed any of this interview, don't fret. You'll find it up on the website within the next few days. So make sure to keep it tuned to 91.8 The Fan. Everything you want and nothing you don't. Woohoo!